Stephanie for that introduction. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So I am following Dr. Vine, almost retiring, Dr. Lindsay, mid-career, and this is my second year with Ohio State, so very early career. Looking at a quick overview of what has happened in the U.S. at large from 2000, 2002, 2012, and 2022, this is the uh, NOAA drought, U.S. drought monitor system, and basically from the 2000 to 2019, I believe nine, nine out of those 19 years have experienced drought conditions. So that's pretty much uh, close to half, 50% of the years the country was uh, facing drought conditions. But pointing out a little closer here in 2012, this affected widely the Corn Belt region and the USDA reported up to 23% of yield losses due to drought conditions in that crop season. So the, the aftermath of this can be uh, truly devastating. And these uh, maps here are for the month of August. And if we wonder what is corn doing around August, this is pollination time, uh, flowering time, and that's when the crop actually requires the highest amount of water. So if we have drought and heat happening when the crop is technically most susceptible for, that's when uh, we can really have uh, those uh, worse results when it comes to crop yields. And this figure comes from Iowa State University. It shows inches of water, evapotranspiration on the horizontal, and then uh, corn yield bushels per acre on the vertical axis here. The point is 200 bushels of corn need approximately 20 inches of water. And when it comes to silking time, that's about 0.3 inches of water per day. So that will be two inches per week. If we don't have those two inches of water, we are already going from a higher potential yield to a lower potential yield, depending on how long that, uh, that is taking place. This is a quick research trial that we conducted last year. Actually, Andrew is sitting here in the front, North Central Ohio. We work in his uh, family operation, family farm. We were doing some work with sulfur. Uh, intentionally, we selected for a heavy clay soil and a sandy soil. That picture is from the heavy clay soil sometime in July. I took that picture. Yield results from that field, uh, roughly 180 bushels per acre with no response to sulfur. But when we look into the sandy soil, where we would expect that response to sulfur, this is what the canopy was looking, higher light interception, happier crop, and then that had an implication into final yields. We are looking here about 244 uh, bushels of corn per acre with 20 pounds of sulfur. I didn't need to bring the plug about sulfur, but since it was mentioned earlier, uh, yes, this is what we are kind of seeing. There are situations where we expect that response, but the reason why I brought this up, it was more looking into this a stress crop versus non-stress crop. Very same day, a few miles away from each other field, and you see almost 60 bushels difference in what the crop is doing. So again, drought and heat has implications in our final yields. Also from Ohio State University data results, Ohio Corn Performance Test. Uh, this is 10 locations across the state every year. More than 100 hybrids uh, are tested. Last year, we were somewhere between 250 and 270 bushels of corn per acre overall uh, for these 100 plus hybrids, 10 locations. But when we go a little bit closer or zoom in to any of those research sites, we actually see that there are some issues happening. For instance, Bangworth location, 226 bushels, that's certainly pushing our overall average bringing that down 
and that was a function or as a result of dry conditions in late June, early July, close to that pollination and uh, tasseling time. So dry conditions, lower yields. In terms of what can be done, uh, these few brands in the bottom, that just shows some of the work that companies, seed companies have been doing already. Uh, the development of materials that are tolerant to drought. It will be interesting uh, moving into the future, not only looking into drought, but also what happens when we have excess of water. So far, this is what we got. And Dr. Lindsay, he did uh, some of, he did this work a few years back. And the summary here is that uh, drought tolerant hybrids can have and use if conditions bring that stress forward in that particular crop season. Now, what happens in other instances is if we have drought tolerant materials, drought tolerant hybrids versus conventional hybrids and we don't have stress, then the conventional hybrid tends to yield better than the drought tolerant hybrid. So yes, there is a news, there is a potential, and when it comes to drought tolerance, this is a strategy that has been already deployed that is, uh, is a tool that we have in the toolbox that can be used uh, depending on where are we uh, located. What else besides hybrid selection? Hybrid selection will be the, the most important tool here, but besides hybrid selection, there is also adjustment to planting dates, just trying to proactively uh, plan and attempt to avoid periods of high risk for heat or for drought, that is, can be July, August. Also spreading uh, that planting date and spreading hybrid relative maturities, that can be helpful so that we are uh, distributing that risk among different uh, conditions. And if something bad was to happen, which usually is the case, then we are uh, less likely to take a, a bad heat into those Optimum seeding rates, as we are changing lower to higher, we are promoting higher interplant competition for light, for water, for nutrients, uh, and, and everything else in the crop system. So really finding out what is our best case scenario, our optimum uh, for how many seeds we want to put in the acre, that, that is a tool that we have as well. Nutrient management actions. Uh, when it comes to drought and heat, that has implications in the uptake of nutrients by the plant. For instance, nitrogen and potassium can be influenced by the reduced water flow coming into the crop. And with that, we might want to think and consider going back to, to the four R principles that includes looking into hopefully the right source, right rate, right timing, split applications, for example, and uh, also placement, placement methods for those fertilizers. If we know that we are in an area that has high risk of drought, uh, this mostly applies in the Western states, not really much in Ohio, uh, but when it comes July, August, last year, for example, we had some reports of drought conditions when the crop was really needing that water. So. Uh, just something else to, to think about over there. Water management, crop rotations, thankfully we practice a lot of that already, corn soybeans versus other crops. Uh, when we are in other regions of the corn belt, sorghum has been an option. Uh, sorghum requires less water than corn, so that can be a mitigation strategy. This picture here is pivots, irrigated acreage in Nebraska and uh, I have seen sorghum being put in the corners of those fields. So that's where the water doesn't reach and in that way they can have a better use of the land. Um, irrigation as a potential strategy. I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago here in Ohio, Top Farmers of Ohio Association, and someone was presenting about 360 rain. That's a new product, new commercial product that is available here in Ohio uh, where people can buy and irrigate your acreage without necessarily investing on a pivot. Uh, pivots, pivot irrigation that works uh, quite well in states where they need more, uh, Nebraska, Kansas. 
And the plug for CTC today, another mitigation strategy for drought and heat is uh, conservation tillage, use of cover crops, uh, which can hopefully bring us better water and nutrient management into the crop.